Good morning. I hope you can all hear. Um, my name is uh, Mahesh. I'm the scientific committee chair for the IOMP, and I'm also the organizer and um, have the privilege to moderate this webinar. I welcome participants from around the world joining today's webinar on the title Radio Pharmaceutical Therapy. So I just want to make sure everybody uh, hearing, uh, have a hearing the voice or volume. Um, before we start the webinar, I just want to thank the IOMP, President John Damilakis, and also Dr. Magdalena Stowa, the Secretary General of the IOMP. In fact, who, she is actually uh, helping or uh, running the whole webinar behind the scene here. I also want to specially thank Dr. Rob Hobbs for stepping in in the last minute to give the talk in place of Dr. Dr. George Seguras, who is unable to join us today due to some emergency, emergent health issues. I also want to welcome Dr. Anna Keys, um, who will be the second speaker of, um, here on this webinar. Couple of logistic questions. First of all, I would like to welcome questions to be inserted in the Q&A section only and not in the chat because I will be monitoring the question answers, questions asked in the QA section and not on the chat. So let me briefly introduce our speaker. So after I introduce the speaker, each speaker will give a presentation. And after both the speakers are done, we'll open the screen for panel discussion and start posing the questions I received, I'm receiving on the Q&A. Also, this particular webinar has uh, carries the credit there uh, and want to remind the audience that those who attend the entirety of the webinar will be offered the credit. And the webinar is also recorded and will be made available within 24 to 48 hours at the IOMP.org website. Without delaying, I'd like to introduce my our first speaker, Robert Hobbs. Is a good friend of mine and a colleague here at Johns Hopkins, and he is an associate professor in the Johns Hopkins Medicine Department of Radiology and Radiological Science, and is a member of the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. His research focuses on clinical and alpha dosimetry, modeling, and external beam radiation. Dr. Hobb is a member of Radionuclide Therapy and Dosimetry Research Lab, which Dr. George Seguras heads and faculty of the CAMPEP approved graduate program in medical physics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His research includes examining how tumor burden and prior chemotherapy affects bone marrow dosimetry. He is an active member of the American Association of Physicists in Medicine and currently chairs the Radio Pharmaceutical Therapy Subcommittee in APM. Recently, Dr. Hobbs was the director of the 2023 APM Summer School in Radio Pharmaceutical Therapy and Dosimetry. For those interested, can actually purchase the edited AAP monogram titled Radio Pharmaceutical Therapy and Dosimetry, which is now available in the bookstore. Without delaying, I would like to welcome my good friend and colleague, Dr. Rob Hobbs, to speak on the imaging and dosimetry in radio pharmaceutical therapy. Rob, please go ahead and share the screen and start. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for having me here. Um, just uh, a, a word before we start, I did step in at the last minute for Dr. Skouros and just want to send out a lot of positive thoughts and energy to him and uh, hope for a speedy and full recovery. Um, so these are conflicts of interest. So my learning objectives have changed a little bit. Uh, I wasn't able to get a hold of slides uh, from Dr. Skoros. So I'm gonna talk about understanding why and know when to use dosimetry, learn how to perform dosimetry, and understand the importance of biologically standardized dose and be able to calculate the BED in radio pharmaceutical therapy. All right, so what is radio pharmaceutical therapy? Um, you see from this little picture here, and this slide was prepared from a resident of mine, Dr. Marsh. Um, 
you can see here we it's it's injected administered activity that circulates throughout the body and is either targeted naturally or is labeled to a targeting agent and so uh, targets disease since it's systemic radiotherapy it has some analogies to external beam um, but it also has some differences for example obviously in the external beam you target one or several tumors and not systemically um, there's a relatively high uh, dose rate that's given by your machine. The uh, absorbed dose to tumors is almost always uniform unless it's designed otherwise, whereas with radiopharmaceuticals, the dose rate is much lower and potentially non-uniform absorbed dose to tumors as different areas can pick up different amounts of activity. Conversely, normal organs tend to be non-uniform absorbed dose in external beam as it depends on beam arrangement, whereas in, in radiopharmaceutical therapy, activity is taken up by the physiology of the different organs and tumors, and so tends to be more uniform in the tumors. And of course, there's hardly any dosimetry that's used. If you compare it to another modality, which, you know, is, you know, most RPT um, practitioners are actually in nuclear medicine, you compare it to diagnostic, then, you know, it's a little bit the same, but now it's therapy. But of course, there are important differences there as well. For one thing, we're not putting photon emitters in, we're putting beta or alpha particle emitters for therapy. For another thing, in, in diagnostic, you're only concerned about a signal to background ratio at a very early time point and only in immediate proximity to what you're looking for. Whereas in radiopharmaceutical therapy, you have to be concerned about your background uptake in every single organ because any organ can be dose limiting. Um, so you have much longer half-lives, which generally works in your favor um, so that you, you, as the activity leaves the normal organs, in principle, it stays in the tumor, and so you benefit from that therapeutic ratio from a longer half-life. All right, but now if we take a look at what is currently being used, um, you see that these are all fixed activity, 100 millicuries for a radioiodine for thyroid ablation, 200 millicuries of I-131 MIBG, 200 millicuries times four for Ludothera, uh, 200 millicuries times four or times six for a Pluvicto, and maybe for Zovigo, you have some mass based. So really what's happening is in practice, it's neither really external beam radiation nor um, their nuclear medicine. It's actually closer to just medical oncology. We're just treating this as a radioactive chemotherapy. Um, and, and the amounts of activity that are administered, one size fits all, have been established by phase one, two trials, which escalate only on activity. Um, and the fractionation is the default, which again is also a chemotherapy type approach, which has the advantage of allowing the treating physician to monitor toxicity, but it's not very scientific. Um, so this came about, this is, this is um, how these, these activities, fixed activities are determined, as I mentioned, the, you escalate based on activity, and the patient with um, that, that shows toxicity limits the amount of activity from everyone. But we know that radiopharmaceutical therapy is radiation, just like external beam. We know that absorbed dose is the metric for or the parameter that helps describe what the damage is. And the damage to an organ, which is, you know, normal organs are what limit the amount of activity that you can give to patients. Um, is not just the amount of activity, it's the amount of activity that goes into a specific organ. So this graph on the left shows organ activity as a function of time, and it's basically proportionate to first order to the area under the curve, where it's amount of how much activity goes to an organ and how long it stays in the patient. And if this patient one is the one who limits um, the amount of activity to be given, patient two, for example, could have much less uptake in that organ and have a faster clearance and could benefit from a lot more activity. So not only do we know how the damage is done as opposed to chemotherapy, or we have a better understanding, is that we can also quantify that by actually imaging it because radiation emits photons most of the time, or at least we can put radioactive nuclides in there that have photons. So we can image and we can quantify how much activity is going to the different organs in any given patient and how long it stays there so we can calculate the area under the curve. So this is the reason why you would want to do dosimetry. 
Um, and this is a huge push that is going on right now. And there's a lot of momentum behind it, but there are also a lot of reasons that we haven't been able to get there yet. And the idea is you would use dosimetry for treatment planning, just like you do an external beam. And the way that would work is you would give a pre-therapeutic activity or possibly a surrogate of a small, so a small amount of activity to the patient, take serial spect or PET images and do exactly what I described, measure the activity uptake and the retention, quantify that activity, convert it to absorbed dose, and then you can calculate the absorbed dose to the organs per unit activity. And then, of course, you can say, knowing the absorbed dose per unit activity in this given patient and what the maximum tolerated dose is for those organs, I can calculate a personalized maximum tolerated activity so that you could give an activity that is suited to the patient rather than a one size fits all. And of course, there are other considerations that could go along. For example, you could have thresholds on your tumor absorbed doses and say, well, we don't need as much as the maximum because we are already giving all the dose we need to the tumors. And disseminated disease um, may, you may not want to give so much activity also because if you give a huge amount of activity, this may also have you know, safety concerns as well. But that's the general principle, okay? So it's opening up the therapeutic window. Here in the dose response, of course, normal organs are more sensitive than tumors if you give the same amount of dose to everybody. In external beam, you use beam arrangement to you know, shift that uh, absorbed dose to the normal organs to spread it out. And then here you, you use targeting to, to open up the therapeutic window. All right, so before we say this is something we absolutely need to do, we should ask ourselves, you know, that sounds nice theoretically, but in practice, does it actually work? And this is an example of administered activity versus absorbed dose from a very early um, uh, study done in the early 2000s where um, the patients were administered um, I-131 anti-CD20. This was a Bexar for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients. And the, um, part or the, the physicians had determined that we could use absorbed dose to the whole body as a surrogate for the normal organ um, dose, which was bone marrow, which was the dose limiting factor. And they determined that 75 centigrade to the whole body was the threshold. And here in doing the very simple dosimetries, they saw that this is the, the amount of activity to deliver to a range of patients that would give that absorbed dose. And so you can see there's a huge variability and this is not atypical, this is consistently the case across all radiopharmaceuticals and all organs, there's a huge interpatient variability of the amount of absorbed dose per unit activity to the patients. All right. This is uh, one of the only, about the only slide I could get from George showing the difference between external beam and radiopharmaceutical therapy. In external beam, you have the radiation that comes, as its names indicate, externally. In radiopharmaceutical therapy, you have to you know, it's, it's, the dose is set, whereas here, your only control in radiopharmaceutical therapy is how much activity you can give. Okay. All right, so there are two methods. One is the MERG method using activity-based phantom. The second is the voxelized method. But there, and there, a lot of differences are accentuated, but really, they all need multiple time point, three-dimensional, so SPECT or PET, emission and transmission imaging, and therefore, they depend on accurate activity quantification, registration, segmentation, curve fitting and integration, and Monte Carlo simulation. So they're all based on the same principles. Activity quantification is where it all starts. If you don't have accurate activity, you're not going to have accurate dosimetry. And that starts with your dose calibrator, so traceable to your national lab. To get your, your, your ac accurate activity, you need to do a phantom study with a known amount of activity, um, preferably an elliptical. Make sure that you're using the same energy windows and collimators as you're going to be using for your patients. Um, and of course, you know the complexities. And I don't have the time, more than frankly, the expertise to go into this. But you need to, you know, scatter correction, attenuation, detector response, collimator response that affect the outcome and the activity. Most of this is done by your machine. Some people tend like to do it on their own. So, what are the two different methods for dosimetry? The absorbed fraction is based on the idea that the total dose to an organ is the sum of dose contributions from other organs. And that dose contribution from each source organ is the number of disintegrations, the energy release per disintegration, the fraction that is emitted in the source organ and ends up in the target organ divided by the mass of the target organ. 
And what the Merck Committee did was they said, well, you know what? The energy per disintegration is a constant. The fraction of absorbed dose from one to the other should be more or less constant for a human being. And the mass of the target has reference human standards. So we can just lump all of those into S values. And so they ran Monte Carlo on very crude um, phantoms and for all the isotopes that they could think of and all the different organs. And they said, now we have tabulated these S values. So now all the physicist needs to do is calculate the number of decays and that we will be able to convert to dose. Now, so how do you get the time integrated activity? Well, you need to take your images here, shown here, as a function of time. You have to register them. You're going to segment the areas that you're interested in. You're going to propagate your segmented region across time. And then you're going to take the area in that region as a function of time, take the area under the curve, and that's you're going to give your time integrated activity, which is the number of decays of the radiopharmaceutical in that organ. Okay, and of course, it has evolved a lot since then. Um, basically, now all you have to do is you put in your values. So this is R's. You can see here residence time, which is time integrated activity coefficients. There's a lot of software that will have all these S values for you, matrix multiplication, and they will punch out your dose values on the other side. And as you can see, um, the phantoms have evolved. They're not nearly as simplistic as they used to be. They have all kinds of different splines, mesh voxelized. It has become very, very detailed. The other method is voxelized, where you do your direct Monte Carlo yourself on the patient images. So it's very similar. You take the patient images, you register, you do your segmentation, define your regions of interest, but you run the Monte Carlo on the different images. And instead of collecting activity, you, you collect the energy. You divide by the mass of the area. That gives you the dose rate as a function of time. When you integrate under the curve, that gives you dose directly. The advantages are you don't depend on the modelized anatomy and you get voxelized results. You get nice looking maps. So this is an example using, using kernel convolution instead of direct uh, Monte Carlo. The image is provided by the University of Iowa, a colleague of mine. Uh, if you take a look at the image on the left, the red, that's what you see from the spec CT, uh, the fusion of the two. And then on the right, you see how the, 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 um, the voxelized dosimetry has been done. You see dose maps with isodose lines. Okay. So uh, there are many uh, computer softwares out there that do this. Um, this is an example of one of them, but they all do the same. One is not really better than another. Um, so you have registration and fusion that can be done, automatic segmentation, quantification. Uh, sometimes the, the, the software companies will help you in the quantification process with your phantoms and, and such. Um, and one of the things that, of course, needs to be done is to fit. And you generally have fitting algorithms in most of these softwares. Um, there are many more FDA-approved softwares that are out there, uh, only a few that are S-value based, and most of the others are voxelized. One of the things to remember, though, is that most of these softwares are relatively new to radiopharmaceutical therapy, and there are a lot more bugs in them than you would expect from your standard external beam software. And so doing the commissioning, you know, validating your software is an important component because it, it definitely, um, you know, this is new, this is not as well understood and as familiar as, as for example, external beam. Um, so voxelized, of course, is so much better, but actually um, not that much. Um, you should be able to do both methods and come up with very similar results. And even though you can see voxelized results, obviously at the voxelized level, you need to understand that there's a large level of uncertainty on the actual quantification of the voxel level because the spec imaging just isn't, doesn't have that resolving power. Okay? And the MERD method is actually much more versatile because it can be used for things that are below the imaging resolution of the cameras. For example, suborgan dosimetry, which we don't have time to go into. So since I mentioned the subject of uncertainties, Activity certainty at quantification is on the order of 10% or a little more for large objects like liver, lungs, et cetera, et cetera. Small objects have spill out, okay? This is an example in this graph where you see um, this is a sphere and you see the number of the, the activity per voxel as a function of radius from the center of the sphere. And of course, it's not a perfect uh, step function. There is some spill out, some of the activity that is in the edge of the sphere has been measured and quantified on the outside. That's spill out. And so um, it makes 
activity quantification more tricky um, because sometimes you might have to draw activity contours on small objects that are different from the anatomical contours. The other option is to use recovery coefficients. You say, oh, I know it's a three millimeter diameter size. And so if I multiply by 1.4, I'll get all the activity back. But you also have to have your anatomical contours because you need it for your mass in the denominator of the dose calculation, right? Dose is energy over mass. And so you need to be able to draw. And that's actually what's the largest contributor to uncertainty at small sizes, because it's very difficult to, you know, and, and somewhat subjective to decide what the actual size of the tumor is and not very reproducible. All right. So why not have dosimetry based treatment planning? Um, I'm going to move a little faster. Um, the, the, the mantra has always been that the onus is on dosimetry to prove it is necessary for each and every modality, but it's very difficult to get um, trials that will test that hypothesis. And so we're in a vicious circle of not being able to prove what we're being asked to prove. The biggest thing that is still a lot of, I won't, I don't have time to go over the other things. Um, the biggest issue that we still have is standardization and QA. Um, the SNMMI dosimetry challenge um, sent out data to a bunch of people to try to, to, you know, to perform dosimetry on, and then the SNMI collected all the results, and there's a huge discrepancy. And this was for people who already thought they knew that they were doing. Similarly, we had an IAEA project where we took new people and taught them the basics and then said, these are the guidelines you have to follow, and we'll compare what the results are. And there was also a huge discrepancy. So being able not only to teach everyone how to do this, but also provide them with all the tools necessary to provide consistent results is really what most of the societies are working on right now. So another reason to do dosimetry, retrospective studies. Um, you know, it's very similar to validation of your dosimetry in, 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 in brachytherapy, for example. If you have post-implant dosimetry, you should have the same thing in radiopharmaceutical therapy in order to ensure, for example, in neutrinine microspheres that the activity goes where you want it to go. Um, and by doing so, if you do retrospective dosimetry, you can establish your own dose response studies and you learn how to do dosimetry and be more comfortable with it. All right. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes for bioeffect modeling. And you may ask, you know, this is a very short presentation and I have um, skipped over a lot of important subjects. So why am I spending time on bioeffect modeling? Um, we know what it is. It's generally not that big a deal in external beam. Um, here's a, a graph representing the linear quadratic formalism where you see uh, cell survival as a function of a bolus in dark blue of external beam radiation. And the lines that represent the BED or the EQD2. The BED in um, radiopharmaceutical therapy is very similar to the BED equation in the external beam, but there's an extra term in here, G uh, infinity, which is the leak hatch side uh, factor. And what it does is it allows for repair between two hits. So in, in classical target theory interpretation of the linear quadratic model, um, the linear part is a double DNA break or a single hit that kills the cell uh, whereas the um, quadratic term is two successive hits that allow for a single strand break or the two hits that are needed to kill a cell. We know this is an oversimplification, of course. It's very, very imprecise, but it still works empirically pretty well. And the rationale in radiopharmaceutical therapy is that there's time between the first, because it's not given all you know, in a single short amount of time, it's protracted over days or sometimes even weeks. And so there should be time to allow the cell to repair itself between the first and the second hit. So the BED is there. Why, again, why, why am I talking about this? Well, the problem is that um, in the radiopharmaceutical therapy, as we saw, there's a lot of interpatient variability of the pharmacokinetics. And the pharmacokinetics are going to determine the dose rate. So it's not like an external beam where the physician controls how much dose per fraction. We know, of course, that it's incredibly different to, to give two grade per fraction and four grade per fraction, but it's the physician that decides that. Okay. The problem here is the physician can only decide how much activity to give. And the rate at which the dose is delivered depends on the individual patient's pharmacokinetics. And so even absorbed dose 
the same absorbed dose from patient to patient in radiopharmaceutical therapy can have different biological outcomes because the dose rate effect doesn't take into account. And so it's important to have a normalized, standardized, biologically relevant dose calculated in radiopharmaceutical therapy. And so you always want to convert your absorbed dose to be either BED or EQD2 or something like that, okay? All right. And if you have BED, that also means now that it's the same, it is the same BED as external beam. And so now you can convert your radiopharmaceutical dose to external beam dose. So not only can you do good, valid dose reporting for patients that come back to external beam, but you can also combine rationally the two modalities. All right. Finally, one last word. This is my last slide, I promise. Um, a, a word on alpha particle dosimetry. And the question is, you know, so most of what I've talked about is really relevant to beta um, particle dosimetry. There are additional challenges for alpha particle dosimetry, which is, means that it's not right even theoretically at this point for dosimetry-based treatment planning. One is the relative biological effect, the RBE, because alpha particles are huge, massive particles compared to electrons that plow through tissue and deal a huge amount of damage, much more biological damage per unit of dose than betas. And we're not really clear on what the RBE value is, okay? And it's probably, it should vary from, you know, organ to organ, just like the alpha beta parameters do. Um, secondly, there's a lot of suborgan localization of activity. Uh, now this can happen also in betas particles, um, but the consequences aren't as dramatic. So as I mentioned before, uptake is driven by physiology. And of course the, normal organs aren't uniform, they are composed of different cell types, different functional subunits. So they can have more uptake or less uptake than others. They can be a very non-uniform distribution. With betas, and or even more so with photons, the range of the energy deposition is such that this often smooths things out, whereas alpha particles are emitted over 50 to 100 microns. And so if you have localization of dose, you often have a localization, or sorry, localization of activity, you will consequently have localization of absorbed dose. And so if you can only image at the organ level and you do an organ level absorbed dose calculation, that average value will not correlate well with outcome. Um, and then of course, a lot of them have a daughters. So when they decay, they emit radioactive daughters, which are then free to move throughout the body and possibly relocalize to different areas. And you have to keep track of those. There's a technical problem because right now we're only giving 100 microcuries or so of alpha particles. And so there's a very low count rate for imaging. Um, and we are working on 3D spec imaging, and there have been a couple of publications, but it's certainly not widespread at this point. And finally, then there's a stochastic energy deposition problem because when you have alpha particles, you have so few, you're, you're delivering large amounts of dose with each decay which means that you don't have the thousands of decays or the more or less uniform energy that is deposited from external beam, you have a very stochastic um, energy deposition. And so you need to take into account the, uh, the, the statistics and probabilistic distribution of that energy deposition. And this is called microdosimetry. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I had muted my phone and thank you, Rob, for such a wonderful, nice talk. I know how difficult it is to um, bring all of the materials uh, you have spent so many time uh, in a, such a short period. There are there are a number of questions uh, in the uh, I want to write, write it to you later, but I want to welcome um, Dr. Anna Keys. Um, can, can everybody mute? the your recording because I can hear a lot of background noise. So let me welcome Dr. Anakis. Anakis is an Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology and Molecular Radiation Sciences. Her clinical focus is on the treatment of prostate cancer and head and neck cancers with radiopharmaceutical therapies and external beam radiotherapy. Her research concentrates on the integration of dosimetry, dose research response analysis, and new radiopharmaceutical therapies into the clinic. Dr. Anna collaborates with the radiopharmaceutical division headed by George Saguras and is also a colleague of Dr. Hobbs 
and I like to welcome Dr. Uh, Anna to present. Her title, uh, talk title will be Clinical Radiopharmaceutical Therapy, Dose Response and Future Directions. Welcome, Dr. Anna. Thank you for the invitation. So we're going to spend the second part of this presentation looking at clinical applications of radiopharmaceutical therapies and specifically focusing on the use of dosimetry to assess uh, dose and response relationships. These are my disclosures, including clinical trial funding and unpaid consultancies and non-FDA approved use of drugs referenced in trials. So we'll first uh, sort of have a fly through presentation of some of the current systemic radiopharmaceutical therapies in practice. I'll focus on those top three agents here that were more recently FDA approved. Um, and due to time constraints, I won't be discussing the ones in parentheses, although there are many exciting uh, radiopharmaceutical therapies um, that are in use in addition to those three. Um, and then we'll turn to future directions, both in active clinical trials and in the areas of dose response assessment. This is a wonderful review article from Dr. Skoros and others um, that came out in 2020 showing the increase in number of publications per year on PubMed on radiopharmaceutical therapies over the past 40 years and really highlights that there are agents in development for many disease sites, not just prostate and neuroendocrine cancer, but also breast, hepatic, colorectal, and other solid tumor types. This includes beta and alpha emitters and um, many different types of ligands from small molecules up to antibodies. And uh, many agents are currently in commercial development. There's actually over 50 industry partners developing radiopharmaceutical therapy agents now. So first I'm gonna to turn to radium-223. This is a FDA approved alpha emitter that um, is actually a very simple, elegant uh, compound. It's radium chloride. And the isotope radium-223 is an alkali earth metal like calcium. So it is taken up in areas of bone turnover into the hydroxyapatite. So in areas of bone metastases, the radium is incorporated into the bone matrix. Um, so the isotope is actually the ligand for treatment. It was FDA approved in 2013 for use in men with castrate resistant metastatic prostate cancer with symptomatic bone metastases based on the results of the Alsimca phase three trial that showed an overall survival benefit uh, compared to placebo of uh, 15 months versus 11.3 months, and also showed a benefit for patients in terms of uh, increased time to their first symptomatic skeletal event, like a bone fracture. Um, this is given once a month for up to six cycles at a dose that's weight-based of 50 kilobecquerels per kilogram. From a radiation safety and logistics standpoint, it's uh, the simplest of the currently approved systemic agents. Um, it's given typically in an outpatient treatment room with minimal precautions for radiation safety, given the limited gamma emissions. And typically the patients only have to have a 30 minute appointment per treatment and the, the um, dose comes in a preloaded syringe and is given as a simple injection with a saline flush. Next, we're gonna to turn to lutetium dotatate. This is lutetium-177, a beta emitter, conjugated to um, octreotite to, to target the somatostatin receptor in neuroendocrine tumors. So it's also given intravenously um, and is incorporated, uh, it binding at the surface of the cell and internalized to cause DNA damage and tumor cell death. Lutetium-177 dotatate was FDA approved in 2018 for patients with advanced neuroendocrine gut cancers. It was based on the phase three never one trial based on a progression-free survival benefit, a very dramatic uh, difference compared to the control of 40 months uh, progression-free survival with lutetium dotatate versus 8.4 months with control. 
This is given as an intravenous infusion of a fixed activity of 7.4 gigabecquerels every eight weeks for up to four cycles. The logistics are a bit more complex. Um, it's also given in an outpatient treatment room, but is typically shielded or separated physically from other clinic rooms with a separate bathroom. And there are significant efforts for radiation protection and contamination prevention, um, specifically uh, related to urine uh, control, and, as it's mostly eliminated through the urine. In addition, um, for renal protection, an amino acid co-infusion is given along with the therapy, and the total infusion time is therefore four to five hours um, per treatment, and there's various infusion or injection techniques that can be used. The amino acid co-infusions, uh, when given as a commercial formulation, often have side effects, uh, GI side effects, but uh, Multiple centers have found that when their pharmacies uh, compound the arginine and the lysine separately, they have significantly less side effects. And finally, we turn to the recently FDA approved lutetium PSMA 617. This targets the prostate specific membrane antigen, which is a transmembrane protein that is internalized after ligands bind to the uh, extracellular portion of the molecule. It's overexpressed uh, over a thousand fold in nearly all prostate cancers, and it is also expressed in salivary gland tumors and in the neovasculature blood vessels of most solid tumors. There are multiple FDA approved PSMA PET imaging agents, including gallium PSMA 11, F18, DCF PYL, which was invented by Martin Pomper at Johns Hopkins, and F18, RH PSMA. The uh, only currently FDA-approved therapy is lutetium PSMA 617, which was approved last year. Uh, but there are many other radiopharmaceutical therapy agents in development, and this is just a very partial list of those that are um, in advanced clinical trials, including beta emitters, al alpha emitters, small molecules, and antibodies. The FDA approval of lutetium PSMA 617 is for men with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer who previously received taxane chemotherapy and androgen receptor pathway inhibitors. There, this was based on an overall survival benefit shown in the phase three vision trial. <clears throat> and here, um, the blue line is lutetium PSMA 617 plus standard of care resulting in a survival of 15.3 months median versus standard of care alone, 11.3 months. Very similar to lutetium dotate, it's given as a fixed activity of 7.4 gigabecquerels every six weeks for up to six cycles. The logistics are similar also to lutetium dotate, but slightly less complex because there's no amino acid co-infusion. So the total infusion time for these patients is um, just one to three hours typically. Uh, and some of the time depends on the specific discharge criteria and instructions that are institution dependent. For future directions, first I want to touch on the many ongoing clinical trials, not just of new agents, but of new um, applications of currently approved agents. So at first, I just want to focus on prostate cancer on this slide. So this is a prostate cancer continuum that shows sort of the PSA over time as a patient uh, goes from having been diagnosed with localized prostate cancer and treated to if they have a recurrence of hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer and then eventually if their disease becomes castrate resistance um, and progresses, um, this is the PSA level over those different timeframes. And um, there are so many radiopharmaceutical therapy trials uh, that are moving different new therapies and existing therapies into earlier line for, uh, for prostate cancer. So the current FDA approval is way over here on the right side at the end of the prostate cancer patient journey as third line for metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And that's what the vision trial tested. 
we just had an ESMO presentation in the past week showing the benefit of OTC and PSMA 617 in PSMA 4, which is pre-chemotherapy, so second line for metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer showed an, a very significant um, progression-free survival benefit. And there are many studies looking at first line for metastatic castrate resistant, also for hormone sensitive, for oligometastatic disease with five or fewer metastases, for patients who have biochemical recurrence only after localized therapy. And then there's even studies um, for neoadjuvant therapy, such as lutectomy, which is pre-prostatectomy therapy. There are other radiopharmaceutical therapy trials looking at new indications for radium-223 in other cancers that have bone metastases, lutetium dotatate in other cancers that express in somatostatin receptor. Many trials of rational combination therapies. So we know that radiation can um, work synergistically with immunotherapies, immune checkpoint inhibitors can also potentially work synergistically with PARP inhibitors for potentiation of DNA damage um, and other systemic therapies. Now, the real medical physics angle here is there's such unique opportunities with radiopharmaceutical therapy trials related to imaging and dosimetry. So we already have incorporated into most modern radiopharmaceuticals uh, PET imaging that is paired for patient selection and response assessment. But as Dr. Hobbs was highlighting, we have the opportunity for spectrosymmetry to be used to evaluate and predict radiation toxicity and tumor dose response and to personalize therapy, investigate different fractionation schedules, investigate rel um, relative biologic effect, tissue dose distributions, and hopefully allow us, to, allow us to move towards individual treatment planning and prescriptions. So turning more specifically to the assessment of dose and response, there are multiple studies recently showing um, what we know to be true empirically. If we increase the absorbed dose to tumors, we will have increased tumor response. So this landmark study of yttrium-90 microspheres for patients with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, this is a dososphere study, this study was a randomized study where patients uh, were randomized to standard dosimetry, prescribing 120 grade tumor versus personalized dosimetry where the dose was escalated to greater than 205 grade to tumor while respecting uh, some normal tissue constraints, including liver constraints. So there was an overall survival benefit, 26.6 versus 10.7 months for the patients that had personalized dosimetry, and that correlated with the higher tumor dose of greater than 205 grade to the tumor versus less than 205, resulting also in an overall survival benefit. And that is a huge overall survival benefit. We don't see those in most cancer trials. Um, for lutetium dotate, there's also recently published a lutetium dotatate dosimetry escalation where a subset of patients had additional cycles of lutetium dotatate to a target kidney biologically effective dose of up to 40 gray. And if the patients that were grouped according to what their actual absorbed dose to the kidney was, and you can see on this curve to, on the left, that the, that the patients who did have um, dose escalation had a longer progression-free survival. And on the right, you can see that the patients had also um, a more likely uh, overall tumor response in the subset of patients that had dose escalation. In fact, five out of 11 of those with greater than 29 gray had a tumor response greater than 50%, which is a 45% response rate. And finally, for lutetium PSMA 617, there was a nice dosimetry study from the Australian phase two prospective study of lutetium PSMA 617, where they did um, calculate the whole body tumor dose, and the mean tumor whole body dose was significantly higher in patients who had a PSA response greater than 50%. So this bar on the right 
Um, and in fact, there was only one patient with a mean tumor dose less than 10 gray that had a 50% PSA response. So this brings up the, thought, the topic of the therapeutic index. As we increase radiation absorbed dose to the tumor, we get increased tumor control. But we also know that as we increase radiation absorbed dose to normal tissues, we have an increased probability of normal tissue damage. And so we're trying to maximize the therapeutic ratio or index in each of these therapies. The specific clinical toxicity concerns that have been discussed most with most recent RPTs include late renal toxicity, salivary gland toxicity, and acute and chronic marrow toxicity, among others. The kidney is a particularly difficult problem because uh, renal toxicity is very common due to renal metabolism and clearance of radiopharmaceutical therapies. Um, for lutetium dotatate in particular, there's proximal tubular reabsorption, and that is what is partially mitigated by the amino acid co-infusion. And for PSMA-targeted therapies, there's actually PSMA expression also on the proximal renal tubule cells, as well as in the blood vessels of the glomeruli in the kidney. So this is an image from a study that Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Skoros and I did together on an alpha emitter, and this is an alpha camera image of the kidney one hour after administration of a PSMA-targeted acetine 211 agent showing the proximal renal tubule and glomeruli uptake. The other main issue with the kidney is that the, the presentation of the toxicity is late, so it is uh, a progressive decrease in glomerular filtration rate or creatinine clearance that doesn't clinically present until often greater than a year after exposure. And most of the published trials don't even have long enough follow-up to accurately report this. So the FDA has limited the dose to the kidney to less than 23 gray based on external beam radiation due to concerns about this, but there's issues with that um, as uh, we'll turn to in a moment. Um, there is some evidence based on retrospective data about late clinical nephropathy after somatostatin receptor targeted therapy. This is a nice study from Lisa Baudet of patients who had yttrium 90 Dota talk that had long term follow up, and this shows the time course over eight years and the gradual decrease in creatinine clearance over that time. And the toxicity rates is were increased uh, correlated with the biologically equivalent dose to the kidney. Um, and this is one of the few studies that actually reports dose versus response in biologically, um, sorry, biologic effective dose, not equivalent. Um, and there's also uh, the relevance of the baseline renal risk factors, including diabetes, hypertension, and chemotherapy. There's also been several recent reports of radiation-induced clini clinical nephropathy after extensive lutetium PSMA therapy. So in patients that got more than six cycles of lutetium PSMA, um, if you follow long-term, some of them develop tubular injury and glomerular microangiopathy. So this is an example recently published of a patient with the progressive um, decline in the glomerular filtration rate, and these are the um, doses of lutetium PSMA radioligand therapy, and the several patients had biopsies that demonstrated specific radiation nephropathy that would be correlated with PSMA therapy. And there is a, a pending publication from this group with 72 patients with follow-up greater than one year. We looked at this in our alpha emitter study, um, and with Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Skoros, we did micro-level dosimetry, um, showing that the dose absorbed by the kidney proximal tubules after PSMA-targeted alpha emitter therapy um, can be even higher than that from the PSMA-positive tumor. And we correlated this with late renal toxicity in mice. These are non-tumor bearing mice that uh, were treated and followed for up to a year after therapy. And the mice that received higher doses died of kidney nephropathy earlier than those receiving lower doses. And 
the maximum tolerated dose was actually only 37 kilobecquerels in these mice, which was a mean kidney dose of only one gray. So it's definitely um, one of the major issues that uh, of concern for radiopharmaceutical therapies. And another area of concern is xerostomia, which is dry mouth related to saliva gland dose. This PSMA is also expressed on um, salivary acinar cells and um, there's been 40% dry mouth shown in the vision trial of the TCM PSMA 617 and 80% um, dry mouth shown in actinium PSA 617, which is an alpha emitter. The mitigation strategies for trying to limit dose, uh, limit toxicities include um, the typical phase one uh, dose limiting toxicity monitoring and then um, the absorbed dose limits that we've mentioned based on external beam data, and then also observational studies um, after FDA approval for long-term safety. As Dr. Hobbs mentioned, the radiobiology of radiopharmaceutical therapies is very different than external beam radiation. So the dose limits of 23 gray to the kidney are likely not relevant to radiopharmaceutical therapies due to a much longer exposure time with a low dose rate and a shorter range. We have a group led by Dr. Skoros called Radiopharmaceutical Therapy Normal Tissue Effects in the Clinic that includes uh, many medical physicists as well as nuclear medicine physicians, medical oncologists, industry leaders, radiation oncologists, and uh, FDA representatives. And we met last year for a four-day workshop and continue with monthly meetings to highlight current issues with those in toxicity reporting, phase one trial design, um, to gather more accurate patient level data and to ultimately analyze normal tissue complication probabilities. So we're hoping to create these types of curves of the potential, for example, this is an external beam radiation uh, quantec curve of the percent uh, incidence of kidney toxicity compared to dose of external beam radiotherapy. And we are looking to create these types of curves specifically for radiopharmaceutical therapies, but need patient level data um, and absorbed dose and ideally uh, biologically effective dose. So this group, we have a paper coming out in JCO shortly um, with our some of our initial kind of uh, consensus observations, and then um, Dr. Hobbs has a paper coming out on alpha dosimetry methods. Um, but some of our main initial points are that we encourage everyone to standardize uh, dosimetry results and methods and report in the standardized ICRU format and ideally report dose in not just absorbed dose but also BED. And we also feel you'll have, strongly. You'll have two minutes. Yes, that uh, ad administered activity escalation should be based on toxicity for acute toxicities like marrow and sal salivary toxicity, and that dose constraints should be updated to the most relevant RPT data. And to conclude, uh, there are so many new radiopharmaceutical agents in practice and development, and this pre presents exciting research opportunities from the basic to clinical spectrum. And the medical physics collaborations are really critical in radio farm research. And um, we've highlighted some of the differences between radio pharmaceutical therapies and external beam radiation. And um, both Dr. Hobbs and I have highlighted that dosimetry should be used to assess absorbed dose, correlate with tumor and normal tissue response, and investigate personalized therapy and dose optimization. Thank you very much. Thank, 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 thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much. Please mute the Please phone. Please mute the phone. I'm going to direct question. There are a lot of questions. I don't think we can cover all of the questions. Um, just to let you know, uh, we had more than 1,700 participants. Um, and I started counting this, uh, the countries, and I lost, lost the count because it's almost like a UN gathering here for the IOMP webinar. I'm very happy. One question before I ask both of you, there are consistently questions asked, why um, 
uh, uh, why uh, we use millicurie instead of megabecquerel. I just want to apologize to the participant because in the US, we are still stuck with the old conventional unit. And that's why we are using millicurie often. When we are publishing any paper, they're always expressed in megabecquerels. And um, as you know, one millicurie is 37 megabecquerels. That's a conversion rate. Before um, uh, heading out, I just want to ask questions and I want to direct questions. There are too many questions, but I'm, gonna, uh, only, I'm trying to pick the most important salient questions um, because of the time limit. First and foremost, uh, Rob, here's a question for you. How long a patient stays in observation on average before sending them home when taking radiopharmaceutical treatment? It depends on the radiopharmaceutical. It depends on how much is given. It depends on the regulatory requirements for the specific country. Um, typically, most patients will return home the same day. Uh, for something like uh, Zovigo, where there's almost no concern of exposure to the people around them, they can leave as soon as they're, they're done. Um, for Ludothera and for Puvicto, typically, Ideally, you want the patient to be able to void because about 50% of the activity will be cleared in the first two to four hours. Um, but you still need to you know, document uh, and rationalize why you can let that person go home. You're also going to give them specific instructions. And if you do allow them to go home right after administration, which is possible, you need to make sure they're not going to be using public transportation or be in a public area for a while. So it's, it's a compromise between uh, the discussion with the patient, where they're going, what they're doing, making sure that there's a criterion that is met for them to leave. And um, yeah, that's about it. But occasionally, like for I-131, which has a lot of photons coming out of the patient, if you give a high amount of activity, and sometimes we give four or 500 millicuries of activity, then the patient will have to be an inpatient because they're not going to meet the any of the criteria on that first day. And so they're typically going to overnight. Dr. Anna, a question for you. Again, there are many, many questions you can also see in the question and answer. I'm just selecting few because of the time frame. Our question is how many uh, points such as images are necessary to build a good tag for activity quantification? My medical physics colleagues have told me that three time points um, spaced out over um, several days after the therapy are usually best, but it really depends on the specific isotope and um, the half-life, the, um, the biological half-life and effective half-life that you expect from the agent to, you want to catch the tail of the PK curve with the last time point. Rob, question for you. How can we be sure that we acquired accurate calibration factor through calibration phantom? Uh, that's tricky. Um, I would, uh, protocols, follow protocols, um, and they are hard to come by, but they are being developed because this is, as I was saying, uh, QA and, and, and quality control is really, standardization is really the order of the day right now. So a number of societies uh, are pr publishing and, and producing protocols that can be followed. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. A question for you. You know, since you're part part of the clinical trials and you also see patients, have you experienced any radiation toxicity cases due to RPT in your clinics? Uh, if if so, what are the doses and how do you manage the patients? And is there any guidelines to refer? to manage patient with radiotoxicity complications? Um, so most of the agents that we currently give as standard of care are lutetium-177 based. And I've seen mild dry mouth. Uh, we're actually working on developing some guidance documents for how to deal with PSMA-targeted therapy-related dry mouth. Um, it's typically for beta emitters, very um, temporary and resolved spontaneously. Um, I've seen um, marrow toxicity, and you can either adjust the dose or delay the dose or consider transfusions if you have marrow toxicity. Um, and then um, I think this will be even more relevant as we move forward into the future for alpha emitters. Um, and I, there's a lot of room for development of guidelines for managing toxicity. 
Thank you. Ram? Yep. Uh, for the lesion segmentation, it's preferred to use CT. However, there are lesions not anatomically defined, like bone lesions. How do you recommend dealing with these lesions? Well, you can't do dosimetry. If you can't define them anatomically, you can't. Um, what you can do is you can define them uh, functionally, um, but the absorbed dose that you value, will, that you calculate will most likely be very, very imprecise. Um, I know thresholding methods are often used and you can use those because you can, you can make different volumes to decide how much activity is in a lesion and what the anatomical size of the lesion is. But anytime you get to something that's very small, and Jonathan Gear published a very seminal um, paper with the EANM dosimetry committee a few years back, which took a look at the uncertainties. And even though in theory, the activity quantification is the largest contributor, when you go to small size objects, once you get below between about, about eight milliliters, the uncertainty from the size estimation and the contouring just blows the, the, the dose, the uncertainties up completely. So. You can't always can, be done. Thank you. As you can see, our uh, audience are expert asking a very difficult questions, very uh, timely questions. Um, Dr. Anna, here is a question for you. Are there any significant differences in terms of treatment outcome between lutetium-177 and actium-225 PSMA therapies? So we, we just are starting to get some prospective data from actinium studies. So um, the most up-to-date data shows that uh, you have a much higher PSA response rate in actinium-225 PSMA-617. Uh, about 90% of patients will have to 50% drop in PSA compared to with lutetium PSMA-617, about 50% of patients will have a 50% uh, drop in PSA. Thank you. Rob, the, a question for you. Um, there are two strands in dosimetry. The one which you showed is a very detailed one, but how do you simplify this for practical use in most centers around the world with limited resources, such as single point dosimetry? Do you have a view as to the value of the latter in addition to more complex one? Yeah, I do have a view. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not generally in favor of it. Um, How long do you have? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I will give us a point out a few things. I mean, so single time point dosimetry uses population average. And the problem is that it, it works reasonably well, 90 to 95%. It can be within 10 to 15%. And these are just ballpark numbers I'm giving out. But you have to choose the right time point. And the right time point depends on which organ or tomb lesion that you're looking at. So that's one thing. Secondly, you know, if you're into diagnostic nuclear medicine, it doesn't matter. But in therapy, if you're trying to treat two thresholds of, of toxicity, then you care about the 5% of people for whom this method doesn't work. Because if something goes bad, that's really bad. And then finally, we talked a lot about biologically relevant dose. Absorbed dose doesn't really correlate as well with outcome as biologically relevant dose. And if you don't know what the kinetics are, if you're saying, you know, single time point only has one time point and it, you know, well, it doesn't really matter if it, what the angle of the kinetics are, you get about the same absorbed dose, but you don't get the same biologically relevant dose. So for those reasons, I'm not in favor of using it for the first cycle. Now, once you have the individual patient pharmacokinetics, I think it's fine to use a single time point to anchor those kinetics. Yeah. Okay. But that's just my opinion. Th thank you, Rob. You have a good opportunity to participate in the TV advertisement for uh, reading the older uh, so fast. That's, thank you. Anyway, <laughs> on a question, this is a question for both the speakers, but I think we already heard from um, Rob to some extent. I'm not going to ask him again, but the question is, do you believe that all patients benefit from personalized dosimetry or is it possible to determine when it will have the greatest impact? Um, so, I do think, you know, more information is better for all patients. So, you know, knowing what dose they received, even if it's just for future purposes, what eligibility they may have for future therapies, um, it is valuable for all patients. Now, it is 
most valuable for patients who you have specific concerns about, such as patients who have renal risk factors or who you're considering another round of radiopharmaceutical therapies, uh, patients that have particular risk of toxicity, I would say, are the ones that um, you may have the highest benefit in uh, dosimetry. So, Rob, I have a question for you. Uh, the question is, um, let me see. There are too many questions. I'm going through the whole thing. Um, is tissue density being increasingly used in radionuclide therapy dose calculation instead of assuming unit density to identify organ mass from its volume? You are muted. Myself again, sorry about that. Yeah, obviously, if you're running direct Monte Carlo, then it's not a problem. Density is being taken into account because you're using the input of the CT as a density map for so that's not a problem. So the issue arises if you're using another method. Um, I would say in general, for most organs, no. Um, obviously, if you're using a um a kernel convolution or voxel S value method, uh, then most of those do have corrections for like something in the lung and in the bone where we know that there can be a somewhat significant difference. Um, even for the MERD S value based methods, um, I mean, it's assumed that the density is known and I don't think there are variations. You should mass correct because there are definitely mass correct for sizes and that can have a big impact. And those are all integrated into S value methods, but not necessarily density except for tumors because uh, tumors can sometimes be a mix of bony and tissue. And so that would have enough of a density change that it would have an effect. And so most S value methods now allow you to specify what type of density in your tumors at least. And a question for you. Um, regarding radium 223 and radiation safety, what about contamination? Dose coefficient for radium 20, 223 are very high compared to normal nuclear medicine radionuclides. Um, so contamination is a risk, um, you know, it's mostly excreted through the stool, so there's not as much contamination risk as with urine. Um, but, um, you know, there's always risk of contamination from the vial or, or injection itself as well. Um, and, um, you know, we certainly do uh, require surveys of the patient and practitioners in the room after each therapy. Thank you. I'm going to wind down the questions because there are too many questions. And I think we are already uh, 10 minutes past the hour. I'm going to take a few more questions. Rob, there's a question for you. I may be, I'm, you're muted. I may be biased. The question the audience asked is, in addition to Johns Hopkins, what other research groups are very active in radiopharmaceutical therapy? Oh, well, that's, I don't want to miss one because I'm going to feel bad. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's definitely a, a growing field. I would say MSK has been around for a long time doing it. Um, the University of Michigan is doing a lot of really good work. The University of Iowa, Wisconsin. Um, and I, I know there are others. Uh, I think those are the bigger ones. Anna, I don't know if I'm missing a, a really important one. Well, I mean, in, uh, there's many leaders in Europe, in Australia, right. in Asia, all over the world. Yeah, and, and this this the subject has generally been around in Europe a lot more, I mean a lot longer, and has been developed more in Europe than in, in the United States. So there are there are a lot of places in Europe that do this. In fact, the European um, uh, and this is very controversial. The Uni European Union mandated dosimetry, and um, for all patients in radiopharmaceutical therapy. But now everybody's fighting over how to actually implement that mandate. So it isn't actually necessarily being done. And there is a lot of back and forth fighting over how and when and if it should be done at all. But in principle, you're supposed to do it in Europe, everywhere. Um, is it like a personalized dosimetry you're talking about? Well, it doesn't specify. Uh, so again, how much you do is, is, is um, yeah, up to. Okay. My question was not to cause any uh, uproar among this uh, controversy, but just to get, so the audience wanted to know other sites were active and thank you for uh, highlighting 
um, uh, the researchers in Australia and Europe and other areas. And this is a very hotbed uh, field and everybody's interested to gather. In fact, that is indicated by the number of people who are participating and you can see the comments, uh, um, they all of most of them are very thankful for both of you for presenting such a um, such a cutting edge research uh, which you both are doing. Before I end, I have one more question which is going to cause a little bit of controversy, and I'm going to uh, pose to both of you. And I also want to take the privilege to answer editorialize my answer after I hear from you. The question is. Um, um, <laughs> In your clinical practice, who is responsible for the dosimetry on Y90 microsphere is, and uh, RPT? Is it nuclear medicine medical physicist or radiotherapy medical physicist? Or there is not a differentiation between the two? I'm going to start with Anna first before I come back to Rob. I know why, where Rob stands and we can go back. Go ahead, Anna. I think this is uh, very institutionally dependent and it just really depends on like specific faculty and staffing of each institution. At Johns Hopkins, it is radiation oncology medical physics that um, does the dosimetry for microspheres, um, but that varies a lot um, based, on, based on institution. Rob? So was the question specific to microspheres or was it for radio? In general, like especially with RPT and all those things, who should do it? Should be, is it a preview of nuclear medicine or radiation therapy? I know it's, I'm throwing in a right. grenade here. So, but I just want to, no, no, I will let it realize that word. Who should be doing it? Uh, both should be doing it. I mean, this is the position of the APM and it's a strong belief of mine. Both nuclear medicine physicists and radiation oncology physicists should be uh, have the ability to do this. Uh, they have overlapping areas of expertise, which, you know, kind of, uh, co which complement each other for sure. And, the, you know, the, the, the field of radiopharmaceutical therapy doesn't fit exactly in the overlap of the Venn diagram, but it's very close. And, you know, both of them have some elements to bring, pharmacokinetics and imaging and understanding the machines from the nuclear medicine standpoint, um, quality assurance, QA, treating, tr just therapy in general in, in radiopharmaceutical therapy, and they can learn from each other. Ideally, you would want both communities to come together and put the patient, you know, at the center of the, of the, of the, of the treatment, um, like a multi-D clinic. Thank you very much. I think that was the best answer. And uh, just to editorialize on the whole thing, and I personally feel as an active member of the APM, this gives a great opportunity for all of us to come together, whether it's a nuclear medicine physicist or a therapy physicist, but keeping the patient point of view as a main thing, we can do more better service to the whole thing. So I strongly feel. So one final question to leave um, happily from this webinar. Um, I want to ask this question to Rob. Um, Rob, the question is, so what about open software? for calculation, calculating the dose in uh, carbon ion therapy, uh, uses some Monte Carlo methods are analytical and other open, your comment about open software for calculations. Yeah, I know nothing about carbon ion therapy. I, I really can't answer that question at all, but open source, yeah. yeah. I mean, MERDCalc is, is an S value. Um, and I think open dose is, the, is also an S value based. Both of those are available. And I think open dose can do more. And I think it can even do, um, Monte Carlo based compilation or some dose kernel compilation. So there are public software that are available and, you know, they're being validated and, and being made available. So, yes, you can use this. Thank you. Anna, a, a question for you is like um, one of the uh, uh, audience asked, like, uh, they would like to know what the FDA's position is on using dosimetry in clinical trials and clinical routine for RPT. Is it encouraged? Is it a requirement? Or just you are avoiding, uh, so, yeah, just uh, it's a requirement or encouraged? My um, general uh, sense is that it's expected in phase one trials um, for there to be dosimetry um, to go along with the dose escalation. Um, and part of that is related to the current use of the absorbed dose limits. Um, I don't uh, believe that there is a, 
anything on the FDA labels um, for lutetium dotatate or lutetium PSMA 617 regarding standard of care dosimetry. Well, I think I want to wrap this webinar because it's already 15 minutes after the hour. And um, I don't want to uh, hold everyone off for, from their other work, but I sincerely thank um, both of you for taking the time and uh, doing it early morning uh, um, on a Wednesday morning in spite of your clinical work. Thank you. Second thing is I'd like to come thank the organizers, uh, the organizing body, the IOMP, which takes pride in bringing the best in the world to give this webinar. And finally, most importantly, I'd like to thank the audience because without the audience, the fruit of the work you guys do is not shared well. And I'm very pleased that to look at this, um, the amount of interest um, indicated by the number of people participating in the webinar. Um, at one time we had 1800 uh, participants and I counted some countries. I could count more than 50, 60 countries and I, I, I kept, I, uh, I stopped there. So um, a home a logistics, this is recorded. It will be available on the IOMP.org. You can Google IOMP uh, 2023 webinars and it'll automatically find the location. And the webinar should be available within 24 hours for anybody to uh, see and uh, review some of the things. With questions. The other thing is regarding the credit. Those who registered for the meeting will be automatically pulled by the system and provided. And if you have any question, you can always reach out to our Secretary General, Dr. Magdalena Stova. I also want to finally thank Dr. Magdalena Stova. Um, she is behind the scene who made the whole seminar webinar run very smoothly. So finally, thank you very much. And um, uh, probably in a year or two, we might follow up again to see how this RPT, RPT is uh, progressing, forging ahead. Thank you, both of you.